Hey, Jason, it's all yours. All right, thanks, Jim. Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to the October uh, General Club meeting. Uh, this af this, uh, this uh, club meeting this afternoon. Now, uh, today we've got our activity uh, is a presentation by our very own Manfred, AG7NR. He'll be talking to us today about uh, experimenting with digital mode FT4 via satellite. So uh, with that said, Manfred, did you have uh, give a slide deck that we'll be able to post uh, maybe after the meeting or are you just gonna yes. free form it? Yes, no, it, uh, there's a slide deck uh, we'll post. Mm -hmm. All right, great, we'll get that posted. Manfred, I'll hand it over to you. Thank you so much, Jason, for the uh, um, uh, introduction and also uh, for everybody to everybody else for um, listening. Let's see, uh, I need to share the screen, All right? Can I do that, Jim? You're muted. Yeah, Jim will have to free up. Yeah, <laughs> you should be able to. Okay, let's see if that works. Okay. Okay. I see. Already having some technical difficulties here. And Manfred, if any questions come up during the presentation uh, in the chat, I'll let mm -hmm. you know. And, yes, please. Right. That okay. We can focus. Okay. Um, let me see if it works now. Should have tried that earlier. Oh, yeah. Okay. That looks better. Share. Okay. Can you, can you see uh, the... Um, Okay, so I put it in full screen mode then in uh, presentation mode. And now you can see it too? Yes, thank you. Excellent, thank you so much. All right, uh, okay, so um, let's see. Okay, I see, this is how it works. Um, just getting my desktop arranged here. <laughs> Uh, all right, so here's a little outline uh, for, for what I'm uh, uh, sharing with you, a little introduction and talk about uh, operational amateur radio satellites in general and some uh, considerations how we use them and then go into digital modes, uh, FT8 and uh, uh, FT4 particularly, but FT8 for comparison. And then there are all kinds of things we need to uh, know about and, and uh, take care of and watch out for, which is Doppler shifts need to know about linear transponders, propagation effects, and then station setup. And, uh, and then I'll show you what I did so far with, uh, with my, my uh, configuration here, and, and also uh, show you some simplifications. If some of what I'm doing or have done uh, looks like uh, over the top, uh, some of that is actually not necessary. So I'll, I'll try to show you also what can be stripped back to make it easy uh, to get uh, started and wake up some interest in, in you all for maybe doing this. Okay, so um, I see, I need to click here and it goes further. All right, so uh, so the motivation for this uh, uh, was to uh, to try to do um, um, FT8, uh, or to, sorry, to, to uh, experiment with uh, satellites beyond FM capabilities. I've done uh, FM uh, and many of us have, especially with the ISS. Uh, for for a while, uh, but at some point uh, it is interesting to try something else. And uh, with the uh, digital modes, uh, as we know from HF, there are all kinds of interesting things uh, that can be done. Uh, uh, getting getting uh, uh, contacts with uh, with uh, a lower lower antenna performance and and things like that. And uh, the question is, what why why is FT eight uh, FT four? I'm sorry. Uh, um, more suitable to this. Uh, FT4, of course, was developed by uh, Frankie and uh, Taylor, and uh, it's a four-tone uh, modulation scheme. Um, and uh, it has an advantage of uh, 10 to 15 dB over CW in many uh, different uh, uh, circumstances. It's, it's hard to nail that down exactly, but because it depends on all kinds of uh, parameters like noise background and uh, atmospheric or ion ionospheric performance and things like that. But uh, General in terms, there's a huge advantage, uh, which uh, allows you to uh, operate at much lower power levels or with uh, compromised antennas. And FT4 was uh, developed originally as an experimental mode, mode uh, specifically for radio contesting, uh, but it also turns out it's very well suited for uh, communications uh, via amateur radio satellites. Okay, so um, 
Here is a list of, of currently operational FM repeaters, crossband repeaters, and, and that list is not entirely complete, but those are the ones uh, uh, that, that work re really well and, and also the ones that I have uh, uh, worked with myself. Uh, so there's the ISS, which has a, a crossband repeater and also it has a simplex uh, a mode to talk to the astronauts directly, but it also has a packet mode and SSTV uh, downlinks and those get activated uh, on uh, some scheme uh, changing once a month or so typically. And then there are some some others, uh, some other crossband repeaters like AO27, 91, 92, PO101, and SO50. Uh, those all uh, uh, have, of course, one FM channel, and uh, uh, some of them have restrictions like limited on time uh, or use in sunlight only. So we have to pay attention to uh, uh, to not violate the operational constraints. And uh, you can certainly go to the uh, uh, AMSAT website, so satellite information and AMSAT satellite status page to see, uh, to see uh, a lot more details. The, uh, once you get the, um, uh, the PDF version of these presentations, so all these links are clickable. So you can just click on them and it takes you straight to those websites. And there's also a list of references on the last uh, page of this. So, so you can uh, work these FM satellites with the uh, regular dual band uh, handheld radio and uh, an aftermarket antenna like a quarter wave uh, whip uh, for VHF. And uh, many of us have done that and uh, that works pretty well. Uh, amazingly well, actually, in some cases. Okay, so then uh, the next would be um, to look at uh, uh, the next step up, which is satellites with uh, linear transponders. And I'll explain uh, in a short while uh, what a linear transponder is. Uh, but, but those satellites allow you to uh, operate in uh, CW or SSB or also FT4 in, in some cases. And uh, here you can see a listing of those. There's AO7, which uh, has been launched uh, in uh, 1974, a long time ago. But and died in, in the early 80s, but then it came back to life uh, <laughs> amazingly in the early 2000s. So I uh, just had a QSO with a CW QSO with a station in, in Redmond uh, the other day, not, not uh, long ago. And then there are some, some other satellites like CAS 4A, 4B, JO97, RS44, and the XW 2A, 2B, and 2F. Those, uh, those are all working. Um, and I tried them out um, either with a two-way QSO in one of those modes or, or just hearing myself back to verify that that is working. And uh, the bandwidth of those transponders um, can vary. Um, many of them have a 20 kilohertz bandwidth, uh, and, uh, um, but, but the new RS, relatively new RS44 has 60 kilohertz and also a relatively large uh, power to transmit with uh, five watts. That is pretty amazing and uh, quite, quite uh, um, generous. Uh, the uh, CAS 4A and 4B only have 100 milliwatts and a 20 kilohertz uh, bandwidth. Uh, so um, those three, uh, I'll show you some data for later in this presentation. Um, um, right, and, and again, uh, uh, the more information can be found on the AMSAT websites, uh, but to operate any of those, uh, in any of those three modes, CW, SSB, or FT4, you do need a dual band full duplex SSB radio, <clears throat> excuse me, and, um, and also better antennas, better usually than, than uh, a little whip, um, even though that, that could work in some cases as well. So that would be quite a step up in, uh, in equipment needed, but we'll get to that shortly. All right, so then regarding operational considerations, generally speaking, uh, of course, amateur satellites are valuable, unique and shared assets with the limited availability. And that is in terms of lifetime, uh, they don't last forever. And uh, they may only be available during certain parts of the orbit, such as in sunlight or, or whenever the uh, operators, the owners of the satellites uh, turn them on uh, for use by the amateur community. So, um, and, then, and then with the bandwidth limitation and also the power limitation, uh, uh, we need to be uh, aware that, that we don't hog uh, the, uh, the system uh, by ourselves and let others have successful QSOs as well. Uh, and also, of course, there are some limitations like in one of AO1, AO92, I think it is, 
uh, that is only supposed to be operated in in sunlight. So if you key up on it during Earth's shadow, um, you could you could drain the battery and and have it reboot or something like that. And and that is definitely not a good thing to do. So we need to be uh, careful and and monitor what the the recommendations usage recommendations are. There are some technical challenges uh, associated with all of this. Um, <clears throat> we're dealing with fast moving objects as relay stations and moving moving at speeds of more than seven kilometers per second. So, so that requires, uh, you need to know where they are, um, accurate orbit knowledge. You also need accurate timing to calculate exactly when, when a pass is, is happening. And, and uh, especially for FT4, uh, there are some, some other strict uh, timing requirements too, which I'll explain in a short while. We're dealing with the uh, weak signal levels usually and Doppler shifts and also propagation effects. So, so there's a whole slew of, of interesting, fascinating uh, things uh, to learn, learn about and, and uh, pay attention to, to make a, a two-way QSO uh, um, possible and uh, successful. Okay, so um, so all right. So now, what about FT four versus FT eight, or, or vice versa? FT eight, as as you all know, gained immense uh, popularity on HF, VHF, and UHF bands uh, uh, in, in the sense that it almost absorbed uh, outside of contest more, more or less all of ninety percent or so of, of the entire activity, which is kind of interesting and uh, maybe not ideal, obviously, but but that is how it is and. Uh, uh, so, so, um, but FT8 is is not suitable for for satellite operations uh, um, in a way. Fortunately, maybe, uh, but FT4 is, and uh, and I just wanted to show you here in a side by side comparison what the differences are between those two uh, uh, protocols and operational modes. So um, FT8 and FT4 have a lot of lot of uh, commonalities. Uh, they both uh, are supported in uh, in WSJTX software, and uh, the modulation is Gaussian uh, frequency shift keying, and the waveform uh, uh, that is generated to generate those tones is is continuous phase FSK, uh, continuous phase frequency shift keying. So instead of uh, switching tones like you would maybe on a piano where you hit one key and then another, it is more like a, a trombone where you move uh, somewhat somewhat smoothly from one tone to the next, but still swiftly, but without a discontinuity. So by, by doing this, uh, the uh, the authors, um, Joe Taylor and his, his uh, uh, co collaborators have, have come up with a very clean scheme that uh, causes very little sidebands and keeps the uh, transmitted signals very ni nice and tight and uh, not causing interference. And that allows you, of course, to have many side-by-side -side conversations uh, in, a, in a relatively narrow band. So for regarding tone spacing, FT8 has eight different tones and they are spaced uh, 6.25 Hertz. So pretty close by to each other, while FT4 only uses four tones and, uh, and they are spaced uh, um, 23.4 Hertz, which is of course, you know, about four times as wide. And uh, the required bandwidth as a result for FT8 is 50 Hertz, but FT4 is uh, 90 Hertz. Uh, the message length is uh, the same uh, in both cases, 77 bits, but the transmit duration uh, is different. It's uh, six times, um, shorter um, for, no, I'm sorry, it's, yeah, it's six, it's, it's two and a half times shorter. So 15 seconds for FT8 and only six seconds uh, for FT4. And that means uh, you can ex uh, exchange uh, six, six messages to complete a complete queue. So um, with FT4 and only 36 seconds instead of 90 seconds at uh, FT8. So, uh, so that is a, um, um, a noticeable difference in the, in the some of the numbers uh, in this right column underneath FT4 are uh, in fact critical for, for doing uh, uh, this through a satellite. Uh, and I'll show you in a, in a short while why that is. So regarding uh, Doppler profiles, uh, that is our, our first challenge here that we need to uh, um, deal with. Um, I'm showing you this uh, uh, for the example of the ISS. Uh, because uh, it's it's rather commonly known. You, you know, not, a lot of us have, have used the ISS with the FM or at least listened, and you even can see it. So you get a nice nice uh, look and feel literally uh, 
for the uh, orbit dynamics when it passes over in, a, in the night sky and in the early evening or, or early morning hours. Uh, but the, uh, the Doppler shifts you can see here on the left side um, during a pass uh, when, when it uses the crossband uh, repeater. Um, it, can, it, it would be 10 kilohertz higher in frequency at 437 megahertz uh, at the beginning of a pass and uh, uh, minus 10 kilohertz uh, uh, lower from the center frequency at the end. So you would have to make uh, um, some adjustments in frequency uh, to make sure you're not uh, hitting the uh, limitations of your um, FM filters in the receiver. And likewise for the uplink, uh, you also need to, when you transmit, not hit the, the uh, band edges of the uh, filters um, on the uplink side. So um, on, on UHF, um, the Doppler shift is three times higher than it is on VHF. So you need to uh, make the uh, um, corrections more often. And uh, typically what we do is uh, program into our radios uh, five channels at minus 10, uh, plus 10, plus five, zero, minus five and 10, minus 10 kilohertz for UHF. And then for VHF, you only need three steps, essentially minus five and plus five kilohertz in the middle at zero. And then uh, you switch those uh, throughout a QSO as, as the frequency changes along that blue curve. So the important question now is, is what happens uh, um, how, how quickly does it change uh, in the middle of the pass? The, this is for high elevation pass. And uh, on the UHF side, you can see that the rate of change can be as high as minus 175 Hertz every second. And uh, um, on the VHF side, it's three times lower, plus 58 Hertz per second. So, um, so if you imagine now that we are not dealing with an F FM crossband repeater, but rather a linear transponder, and we are trying to send an FT8 signal, an FT4 signal, I'm sorry, where the tone spacing is, is uh, 23.4 Hertz. And then uh, it changes every second by that much, multiple, multiple tone spacings. Uh, you can see that if, if there's no, not a careful correction made, uh, you, would, uh, you would confuse the FT4 decoder software very quickly and uh, it would not decode correctly. So, so that is the first, uh, um, challenge to deal with. All right, so um, uh, here's a little summary uh, of, about the orbit geometry and the Doppler rates for some of the uh, satellites. Uh, uh, the ISS I just showed you, um, it's at an altitude of 420 uh, some kilometers at 51 degrees uh, inclination with respect to the equator. And the Doppler rates are what I just showed you, 58 uh, hertz per second uh, maximum at uh, uh, VHF and 175 at UHF. Uh, for CAS A, CAS 4A and CAS 4B, those two uh, satellites, those are Chinese spacecraft, they are um, uh, so somewhat higher in altitude, uh, 540 some uh, kilometers and the lower inclination, uh, 43 degrees. So they don't come over Seattle at, uh, as, a, as a high elevation path, they're more in the south. Um, and, and also have then uh, lower Doppler rates. And then RS-44, that is our flagship uh, um, amateur satellite, we got, as far as linear transponders go at the moment, uh, it has an altitude of 1500 by 1170 kilometers and it's in a polar orbit. Uh, and so it is higher up and, and therefore moves more slowly uh, and therefore also has uh, lower Doppler rates, a uh, maximum of 18 Hertz at, uh, per second at uh, VHF and 53 at UHF. So being higher up also means it has a larger, what we call larger footprint. Uh, so you can have QSOs uh, uh, at longer distances, even if you're lucky all the way to Europe. Uh, um, and that is of course difficult from our vantage point in the Pacific Northwest here, but uh, but uh, in, nevertheless, uh, this is a great, uh, great satellite to work with. Okay, so um, there's one true rule for Doppler compensation. Um, as, as AMSAT or the AMSAT leadership has put it uh, to, to make sure everybody knows and, and, uh, and uh, obeys by this rule. Uh, and that, that rule uh, is uh, similar to what we just talked about for the ISS. You need to adjust your, your frequencies. Uh, both the uplink and the downlink, so so that you find yourself operating at, at the same frequency on the satellite and not drift drift around and, and cause trouble to others and yourself. 
<laughs> so, so that's what that rule essentially says. Uh, the uplink and downlink frequencies need to be updated independently. Um, so, so you can't just uh, do the same adjustment for both both uplink and downlink at the same time. The, the magnitudes are different and the signs are also different. And uh, and that that way uh, you you treat the system as if it was a stationary repeater, say a, a transponder sitting on top of Tiger Mountain instead of flying at uh, seven kilometers per second, um, and uh, and that works really well. So okay, so so talking about linear transponders, what is it? It's it's uh, of course uh, rather distinct from a. Um, a cross band FM repeater in the sense, in the following sense. The um, a linear transponder has a receiver and also a transmitter, and it receives a certain bandwidth, such as uh, a 60 kilohertz in case of uh, RS44, and it takes that entire band and copies it over as a mirror image to the downlink and then transmits the entire band. Whatever it sees on the uplink gets copied over. Uh, as mirror image and retra retransmitted on the uh, downlink. So um, in case of RS44, uh, um, it, it has a center frequency for receiving at 145.965 megahertz and, uh, and then a bandwidth of plus minus 30 uh, kilohertz on, uh, around this. And that gets copied over and uh, retransmitted at 435.640 plus minus 30 megahertz. So if you, in other words, uh, transmit a signal that is say uh, a 10 kilohertz above, uh, 10 kilohertz from the upper edge on the uh, uplink band, then that signal gets retransmitted 10 kilohertz above the lower edge for the downlink. And it also swaps uh, sidebands. <laughs> so, so that is uh, quite interesting and uh, um, but important uh, to, um, uh, to consider. So a station A is transmitting, say, at a frequency that corresponds to where this red line is, and that gets, trans gets uh, relayed over and gets retransmitted uh, at the uh, UHF frequency. And then station A can hear its, uh, its own signal back, but station B, your, your potential QSO partner, can also hear that same, same signal and vice versa. So when then station B is transmitting with the correct Doppler correction so that it effectively also lands at this uh, same, same red uh, frequency here. Uh, that also gets relayed and then station A can hear, hear what station B has transmitted. So, so that is how this works. And both stations, uh, according to this one true rule, have to do their own Doppler corrections to make sure they are always present to the satellite uh, the, the, uh, the nominal uh, frequency. Uh, in this case, on this red bar, and then they also receive uh, from the satellite the um, the uh, downlink frequency that matches that. So that is how a um, linear transponder works. Uh, the uh, total. It's important to note that the total power is 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 used by shared by all users. So in the case of RS44, that total power that it transmits this downlink band at is five watts. So so if you were transmitting a huge uplink power. Um, then the uh, transponder would uh, would amplify that and transmit it back and, and potentially use up all of all of its five watts for your for your own uh, say CW signal, and and deprives everybody else uh, who can uh, who who could use the uh, tra uh, transponder at the same time of a successful QSO. So we have to really be careful to only need uh, uh, set set the transmit your our own transmit power to. Um, what is needed to uh, to to uh, uh, have a nice nice cue so at a good good signal to noise, but not overdo it and, and make sure others have a shared power resources as well. Another thing to uh, to uh, uh, notice that uh, there is no subband allocation for the satellite uh, transponders. Uh, much you know, unlike we have say on HF where there's the lower bands divided up usually for. A CW and digital modes, and the upper parts of the bands are for sideband. Um, so, so in this case, uh, anything goes essentially. But to avoid confusion, especially when you do FT4, mm -hmm. the recommendation is to to select your frequency such that you are always within the lowest a few kilohertz of the downlink band, like it is indicated here, uh, and that allows others to to do a CW or sideband uh, to go to to the uh, to the remaining sections. 
of course, uh, RS44 is rather wide, 60 kilohertz wide. So that leaves a lot of space for, for multiple QSOs going on at the same time. But we, you certainly don't want to step with a strong FT4 signal onto somebody who is trying to have an SSD conversation. Okay, propagation effects, another interesting topic. Um, so so um, um, there's an effect called Faraday rotation. And what, what happens here is if you have a satellite out, out, uh, orbiting outside the ionosphere and it transmits uh, signals um, at, uh, at VHF or UHF or both at the same time, um, potentially, or receives, I should say, a VHF and, and transmits UHF, but both signals po uh, propagate through the ionosphere. What happens is you have a, um, uh, some, some electron content in, in the ionosphere and, uh, and your waves are coming through and uh, in the presence of the magnetic field, the, uh, plane, the, uh, the plane of the electric field, the polarization changes, it rotates as it goes through. And then it comes out uh, and, uh, and travels onto your ground station antenna. So, um, so the effect is actually quite <laughs> dramatic. Um, and it is much larger at lower frequencies than it is at higher frequencies. So, so just to give you an example, if you were looking uh, at, a, um, at a satellite mm -hmm. at an elevation of 30 degrees from the vantage point of the US, uh, which, which kind of uh, tells what kind of magnetic field lines we have uh, over our, our country here, uh, there can be as many as 14.4 revolutions uh, as it goes through the ionosphere. Uh, and so you can see at, uh, at UHF, it's nine times fewer. It goes with the square, square of the frequency. So um, what that means is um, as a satellite passes over overhead and you follow with the antenna, uh, that path uh, through the ionosphere keeps changing all the time because uh, there are different geometries involved uh, um, throughout the path, and, and therefore that uh, uh, the length of, of the um, um, path through the ionosphere changes, and therefore also the number of uh, rotations keeps changing on you. So, um, uh, so, so what that does is if you have a linear polarized ground station here, like a ground antenna, like on the left down here, you can have times when uh, your signal is completely wiped out. If the satellite is, is linear polarized and, and then your, your phase is rotating and, the, and the, uh, the electric field vector is coming out uh, 90 degrees up, um, um, perpendicular to your ground antenna, then you have a complete uh, dropout for a moment and then it comes back. So you see those uh, signal fades and that can be um, eliminated if you use a circular polarization. So, so um, there can, can of course also be a, a polarization mismatch even if there was no ionosphere because the uh, satellite antennas could be uh, perpendicularly polarized to your ground antenna um, even without ionosphere and the circular polarization on, on your ground antenna would take care of that too. See you. Um, okay, so, so let me see. Um, now we'll go to uh, talk about equipment and software requirements for, for using FT4. So I already mentioned uh, you need a radio that is SSB capable, full duplex, dual band VHF, UHF radio. Uh, you need antennas, um, ideally um, circular polarized VHF and UHF antennas, but uh, linear polarization will do uh, to get you started. And um, the fact that the FT4 transmissions are really short, you can squeeze it in. Uh, into those uh, um, phases of a pass where the um, um, signal is not faded out. I mean, you may have to have multiple tries and then eventually can uh, still uh, complete a QSO. Uh, then of course you need uh, computer control um, uh, to do these Doppler corrections of your radio and, and also to process uh, FT4 signals. So, um, so there are different uh, um, operating systems, of course, Windows, Mac OS, and Linux, and those are the main ones. And there's software available for each of those. There's a SAT PC32 for Windows, Mac Doppler for Mac OS, and uh, GPredict uh, for Linux. And uh, for, for controlling the ICOM 9700, you also uh, probably need a Python script to translate some of the uh, command sequences. All of that can be found online and downloaded uh, 
and uh, and uh, for Linux, I think uh, gpredict uses the ham hamlib, uh, so that needs to be updated, or maybe has been already in the meantime. And then you also may need a single link use USB audio interface uh, to monitor the downlink. All right, so um, here's what I have uh, done. I did splurge this summer and for the first time in my life, bought myself a radio that is uh, uh, capable of uh, uh, doing CW and SSB on, uh, on VHF and UHF. Uh, so that was a 9700 um, ICOM unit. Uh, I was a little disappointed first before buying it when I read that its frequency stability is unfortunately not uh, as, as high as uh, uh, one would have hoped. Um, it has a 10 megahertz input uh, for reference frequency, but that is not used to, uh, to phase lock the internal oscillators. It's only used as a calibration input uh, to tune it uh, somehow. So, um, so, so that was a bit disappointing and I held off on, on the purchase until I found out that there's a brilliant uh, solution to get around this. And uh, that, that, uh, uh, that uh, solution uh, um, is, is about uh, taking a, a little GPS receiver and injecting a, a reference signal into the uh, oscillator internally, and, and then it phase locks it completely. So, uh, so I'll show you in a moment uh, uh, how that works. In, uh, so for, for operating FT4 through satellite, uh, you need to have uh, uh, two instances of uh, WSJTX. And the reason for that is even though you have a, um, a, uh, um, a full duplex radio, you can hear yourself. Uh, in principle, the uh, software WSJTX does not receive when you transmit, while you transmit. So, um, so for that, that reason, uh, an, a second instance of, of WSJTX is needed. And you can run that either on the same computers using some tricks or, uh, or you can use it on a separate computer just to simplify things, at least when you start uh, doing some testing. So, um, so what I did is I used uh, one, one of those laptops uh, um, to control the radio using its CAT interface and, and SATRAC, my own, own software, it turns out for doing the Doppler corrections and then uh, uh, use on the same USB cable uh, connection to the audio interface. It has a built-in sound card, uh, so you can really uh, uh, do this all nicely in, from, from, one, uh, from one laptop in principle. And then uh, to monitor the downlink so I can hear myself back and see my own uh, waterfall displays uh, uh, through the satellite, I use the second laptop to also run WSJTX and, and, and use the signal link uh, audio interface that was just connected to the audio output of the radio. And that really uh, uh, works very nicely. Right, so about the I, ICOM I, IC9700 upgrade, um, there's a um, gentleman uh, by the name of Leo Bortner, M0XER in Britain, Great Britain, and he came up with a brilliant solution uh, to, uh, to uh, clean up the uh, frequency drifts in the ICOM uh, 9700. And what, what he did is, uh, you can see here, there's a little board uh, that gets installed inside the uh, ICOM unit. And uh, you can see uh, underneath uh, what is underneath, there's a tiny inductive coupler that, that protrudes into the, um, uh, physically into the, uh, into the internal oscillator cavity. And, uh, and you give it this external signal of 49.152 megahertz at uh, plus, TB, plus 10 dBm. And it completely swamps out the uh, internal oscillator and it makes it lock uh, cleanly onto that external signal, uh, which then is uh, GPS locked. So, um, so there's a, on the left side, you can see uh, the uh, setup here. There's the uh, tiny GPS receiver and, uh, and the GPS antenna here on a little metal tray. And uh, you can see the uh, reference signal uh, of, of uh, plus 10 dBm at that frequency on the spectrum analyzer. So that is fed in and voila, it looks beautifully. There's a little uh, configuration tool that comes with it. Here's the Mac OS version. So you can, can program uh, the frequency and the power output uh, of this little GPS receiver and then you're done. You can just plug it in and uh, it works ever after. So I did that and that worked uh, beautifully. Right, and then antennas. <laughs> uh, I have been building, working with these egg beater antennas for a while. And uh, some of you may remember, I brought them out to the uh, field day at Fort Flagler in uh, 2019. So, uh, so those were built completely from scratch um, using the design 
by Oscar November 6 Whiskey Golf, and he also has a French course and F5 uh, VIF. Uh, and uh, the, again, there are, there's the link in the presentation at the end. Uh, you can search online, and uh, it has all the descriptions there. So, so I went to uh, to the uh, to Lowe's in this case and uh, bought some uh, um, some plastic uh, um, piping materials, <laughs> just like we did for the uh, uh, Fox Hunt antennas, similar to that. And then uh, and then it has phasing harnesses inside to uh, to cleanly cleanly feed the uh, um, the two wire loops with the, uh, from a coax input. Uh, so you need some phasing lines and you also need the, um, the impedance matching lines, right? So, so all of these pieces of cable here are needed to, uh, to perform uh, that cleanly. And, and then uh, at the bottom here, you can see what that looked like for the VHF antenna shortly before disassembly. It all had to fit into the, uh, to the little mast tube. Uh, and then uh, the wires are, are uh, one full wavelength uh, long at, uh, at VHF or UHF frequencies. I should also uh, mention uh, the separation uh, as to how high the uh, feed point is from the metal surface underneath uh, determines uh, what the radiation pattern looks like. You can bend it up in the sky and give it some more uh, gain uh, as opposed to having an omnidirectional antenna. Uh, that way, so um, so I did that and uh, used it for mobile stationary mobile uh, uh, work for a little while, and uh, and then I had those antennas and thought, okay, well, what about uh, using those maybe with the uh, ICOM now uh, in a in a home application? Right, and so here they are. Uh, now they moved from the car roof to uh, the desk inside my shack slash office on the third floor of our townhouse. And so, uh, so the ultimate destination was, of course, to put them uh, higher up. Uh, in, in our case, here inside the attic, uh, since uh, there's no no easy roof access, and uh, and it's also protected, of course, like a ray dome. <laughs> um, but but nevertheless, I wanted to try that all out first to see what happens uh, and make it work before before climbing into the attic and doing the installation there. So here they are, both uh, sitting on the desk. Um, and there's a, uh, you can see here at the middle of the bottom, there are some preamplifiers and filters, and I'll show you that next, what that is. Right, so here's a, um, a preamplifier and filter board I put together, all components are screwed on conveniently, conveniently onto this uh, uh, cutting board that was repurposed and was, was obtained from, uh, from a famous Swedish uh, supply store. So, uh, so what I did here is uh, I got I got these amp preamplifiers, and the best ones I could find are from uh, JG uh, High Technology. Yuri Gerardi, uh, IZ4 OSG in Italy, has made those. He has a company and sells them. They have excellent performance: uh, uh, 0.2 dB noise figure at uh, VHF and uh, 0.35 at UHF. Again, both gain of 24 dB. Uh, they have uh, a built-in RF box up to 100 watts. They have input protection on the antenna side, so you don't accidentally zap them. And the DC supply voltage can be uh, fed directly uh, out of the ICON 9700 uh, uh, through the coaxial cable. So uh, that's an interesting feature. It has uh, built-in uh, uh, DC supplies uh, ready to go. What I did here is out of an over, overly uh, uh, a, a cautious approach, so I put in some uh, diplex and triplex or filters with uh, some dummy loads to make sure that if you transmit at high power with one antenna, it doesn't zap the other preamplifier. So, so the uh, out of band signals are dissipated in these uh, dummy loads here, and that is a pretty safe uh, uh, situation then. And here you can see uh, now what I did for the uh, software controls. I let this one here, oops. Let, let, let this one here so you can see this is what the software control Doppler corrections for the um, on the radio look like. Um, the UHF side is, is updated um, as fast as every 200 milliseconds and VHF uh, uh, every third update, so every 600 milliseconds. Remember the Doppler shifts at, uh, at UHF are three times higher, so you have uh, uh, some leeway at VHF uh, um, and uh, to optimize the speed, uh, I came up with that uh, weighted scheme. And it's also running uh, the calculations 100 milliseconds ahead of time, uh, because otherwise you're always uh, behind uh, time-wise to update. So, so that seems to be working, working uh, very well. 
One can also tune the radio, by the way, uh, with the uh, phone pen, uh, uh, with that big knob while uh, the Doppler corrections are going on. So it superimposes it and you can find your QSO partners that way. Okay. And then uh, with the antennas, with all of that in place, uh, the uh, ICOM radio uh, cleaned up in frequency stability and, uh, and the antennas in the office. Uh, I did some test QSOs with uh, RS44 and uh, with only 2.4 watts RF output. So that is less than uh, about the same as what a typical handheld radio puts out. So that is pretty safe uh, having these uh, egg beaters here in the same room with the operator. Um, and uh, I had pretty much right away uh, in the first 24 hours, uh, three successful QSOs with uh, stations in Illinois and Texas uh, using that setup out of, out of the uh, office here without even uh, trying very hard. Uh, so that was pretty amazing and encouraging. And you can see, if you look at the uh, frequencies here, they look all very stable, 1302, 1302. Um, one hertz uh, variation only, and uh, I can show you some more data in a short while. So, so the frequency corrections work really well. So, right, so to put the antennas in the attic, I thought, okay, um, Maybe, maybe they should not be uh, just on a flat surface horizontally, but what if I tilt them uh, 45 degrees? Um, and uh, and the, the effect of that is uh, to bend the antenna pattern over towards, uh, towards the middle of uh, our continent here, because there's not much coverage required over the Pacific. So, uh, so that's far away to Japan or Hawaii, and uh, there's not much to be had in terms of QSOs uh, in this direction, but what about uh, tilting the antennas towards uh, the east by 45 degrees? And I did some modeling here in, uh, in uh, Coco Neck uh, to show what that would do. And so you can see uh, this would, uh, in, in elevation here, uh, <laughs> um, provide a very nice coverage uh, for, for the entire continent looking, looking that way. And uh, the uh, left uh, plots here are, are a uh, azimuth cut through the uh, elevation pattern at 45 degrees. And uh, so the antennas were, instead of on a car roof, they are mounted on uh, um, 61 uh, by 91 centimeter, two by three feet uh, aluminum panels. Okay, so here's what it looks like. Uh, there's not a lot of space in our attic. You can see uh, it's, it's more like wet shaped. It's a crawl space effectively. Um, so you can see the uh, VHF antenna here at 45 degrees pointing uh, up to the east and the UHF antenna uh, in the background a little bit further away. And the filter and the preamplifier panel here attached to this wooden strut. Cables are used uh, LMR240 uh, at a total length of uh, 7.6 meters from the filter panel to the ICOM radio. And the losses are pretty low, 0.9 dB uh, for two meters and uh, 1.6 for uh, 70 centimeters. The attic insula insulation, of course, which is 18 inches deep, uh, had to be removed uh, temporarily. <laughs> and I installed some walking boards uh, to avoid stepping through the uh, plaster boards and also wore um, protection and N95 mask uh, to avoid these fibers here. And also uh, a hard head because there are nails protruding through the roof. So it's, it was quite a, quite a, operation, but it's uh, it's all finished and works beautifully. And I also have an HF uh, G5 RV antenna in this attic along the rim. So, um, and the GPS antenna is up there as well. Okay, so uh, so here are some, some tests. Here's a, a successful QSO with the Whiskey Charlie 7 Victor uh, as RS44 uh, came, uh, came by. You can see that is a, a pass that didn't go above uh, 30 degrees elevation here in the uh, northeast. And uh, here you can see um, my own signals, uh, um, what that looked like on the waterfall display and then uh, in the w WC7V signals are uh, much stronger, it turns out. I was uh, transmitting at, uh, at low power with these antennas in the attic, probably at uh, 10 watts maybe. And uh, look at look at these uh, frequencies here. The, uh, these are the audio frequencies, of course, uh, um, reported from uh, WSJTX. And uh, you can see uh, my own signals uh, are within plus minus one Hertz. And so are the ones of the other station as well, 20, uh, 421, 2423, and again, 2423. So that's also 20, 2422 plus minus one. So that, that shows uh, what can be uh, expected if, if you do this all correctly. And uh, 
you can never tell from looking at this that we are working through a satellite that moves at se seven kilometers per second. Uh, it might as well be a, a trans transponder, a linear transponder sitting on Tiger Mountain. It, it would be looking the same, actually. <laughs> so it's a kind of interesting thought. Okay, um, so that was a, a good, successful QSO. Now, um, what I wanted to show you is, uh, okay, what if, what if uh, I did go a bit overboard and was overly cautious and overly ambitious putting uh, the uh, a GPS uh, reference locking into the unit. Uh, what, what if you turn that off? And here you can see what, what happened. Uh, so the waterfall, of course, goes from the bottom uh, uh, to the top. So the first uh, five copies uh, are with the GPS receiver connected. And then I just unplugged it. And, uh, and you can see that it jumped. It jumped uh, uh, by, by about 40 hertz from uh, 38, 1389 to 1429 Hertz, but it's still stable and, and it continues to um, decode the FT4 signal just fine. So, so that shows uh, the ICOM radio is, is uh, in principle stable enough and you don't need to do anything special. So I'm glad I, I did put in the uh, extra effort because that allows you to make those types of tests and share the results. But, but others uh, can, can then follow and don't necessarily need to make that uh, upgrade uh, and save some costs and, and complexity. So for this test, I also used uh, uh, relatively low power VHF uplink power, seven watts only. Uh, that works just fine. You get a clean uh, decode here be of, um, of between, uh, depending on the time and circumstances of that pass between minus four and uh, minus 13 uh, dB. Right, so then uh, I did a test with uh, CAS4A, uh, which has a much, much uh, less, um, less uh, uh, capable transponder. It only puts out 100 milliwatts on the downlink. And yet uh, uh, you can see a, a very clean, uh, clean uh, um, transponded signals, FT4 signals here. In this case, I uh, used the ICOM 9700 SA. So, so uh, from the beginning of the pass, the GPS receiver was disconnected and I put up a, a, a short tuning a signal here first uh, to see if I can see myself. But then you can see as the transmitter warms up, it starts drifting and then it stabilizes after, after about a minute. Uh, but during those, those first uh, 60 seconds, it drifted by about 50 Hertz, which is also still uh, quite acceptable. Uh, so, so that shows you what, what uh, that, and that is what people were, were talking about and saying that ICOM didn't really do a good job with this radio. They should have put in a, a proper lock circuitry and uh, include that all, but, but with this upgrade, you can take care of it still. Right, so then I thought, okay, I'll do another test. Uh, it's kind of nice to do those tests uh, late in the evening or even early night after midnight when uh, nobody else is using uh, the satellite, so you can do some some fun tests and uh, explore the engineering aspects uh, by yourself without disturbing anybody else or getting a, a QSO callback. Um, so, so here's a case when I, I set the uh, Doppler intervals updates to one second instead of uh, 200 milliseconds, and you can see that that is, is not working right here. At the bottom, uh, um, it, it is definitely uh, uh, smearing it out, and it's not, not giving you... Uh, any clean uh, decodes, but then as, as the pass goes on towards the end of the pass, when it disappears over the, the horizon and the Doppler shifts don't change much anymore, uh, it begins to decode. So you just gradually wander into the uh, regime where the, um, the uh, uh, tone drifts uh, due to Doppler are, are smaller than the uh, uh, tone separation and then it locks up. Right, and then I also did an, a test and, and I wanted to see uh, just for a brief moment what happens if you don't do any Doppler tracking. You can see it was first Doppler tracking here for a while. And then I just stopped the software for, for a few updates and you can see how it takes off immediately, of course, at a rate of 26 Hertz per second, uh, which is in the range of what I showed earlier in the uh, numerical data uh, early on uh, about CAS4. So, so that is what happens if you, if you and then I re-enabled the software and it went back on. You can also see that uh, the, even with the um, uh, GPS uh, connected, um, there's still a small drift, but that must be then on the satellite. Uh, it has, of course, crystal oscillators to make reference frequencies for, for doing the, uh, um, the uh, 
the linear transponding, shall we say. Um, and if the, and the, there may be some frequency drifts because of temperature changes, and, and that makes makes these drifts that you can see here in this uh, this uh, illustration. Right. So simplifications. Can we save costs, uh, reduce complexity, and still work? FT4 via satellite. The answer is yes. I showed you. Uh, I, I did do a few things that may be over over the top, but if you undo those. Uh, um, it, it is working beautifully still. Um, in fact, um, uh, one of those those previous examples also showed what happens when when I don't use the um, these Italian uh, preamplifiers, but rather use what the uh, ICOM radio has built in. If you turn on the internal uh, preamps, and and as long as you use uh, low loss coaxial cables and short runs, uh, that works just as well, right? So you can really work that uh, work uh, FT4 with the radio as is. Regarding antennas. Um, one should be able to use uh, uh, simple vertical uh, antennas, for instance, um, J poles, dual band mobiles. Although, um, of course, uh, you, you get periodic signal fades that way. You can, of course, also, if you have a Yagi or do two Yagis for VHF, UHF, horizontally polarized, you, you can easily use those to look at a, a, a satellite pass that is near the horizon uh, somewhere. So, uh, so that should work, of course, without any changes, but the, you would also get signal fades uh, every so often with that. Uh, and uh, and running, uh, you can also run, instead of what I did using two laptops for running two instances of WSJTX, you can uh, run them on the same computer, um, uh, one for doing the QSO basically, and the other one for monitoring your downlink only, so you can save that signaling box. It's, it may be a bit tricky to do that. You have to watch out that the two instances uh, are not stepping on each other and only one talks to the radio, but there are ways to configure this uh, apparently, which I haven't tried myself. All right, so uh, so how many people have been uh, using FT4 through uh, satellites? It's a small, small group. Uh, there was a nice AMSAT article that I came across that got me started on this uh, by, uh, by uh, uh, W zero D H J I think or similar the the reference is, is in the uh, um, in the on the reference sheet uh, on the last page. Uh, uh, take a look at that AMSAT article if AMSAT journal article if you if you like. And uh, so the number of users is relatively small. Um, I have seen myself using using PSK reporter for two meters here. Uh, stations, there, there may be another dozen or 15 or 20 across the US, and I worked about uh, a third of them so far, or maybe half, as many as half, uh, but but uh, there's still room for growth, obviously. Uh, so, um, yeah, so concluding remarks, uh, so, so I, I tried to do something a bit more challenging, and I would other, encourage others to try that too. Um, enjoy the new capabilities that digital modes offer for satellite communications. Uh, you can do amazing things uh, with uh, rather low power, um, apparently. Uh, keep in, in mind that satellite transmit power and bandwidth are limited, so those are shared resources and we don't want to hawk them, obviously. I would also encourage uh, those who are interested to sign up for the uh, MZ Bulletin Board uh, service, MZBB email list uh, to stay informed. Uh, there's a lot of information uh, that people share about uh, how to use FT4 and, and any other modes or updates on new satellites and uh, or restrictions for use and things like that, that is important. And then I also would like to offer um, help. Uh, if, if anybody wants to give this a try, I'd be more than happy to, to, to help uh, and, uh, and work with you. Um, and it could be uh, as simple as uh, me, me uh, uh, transmitting an FT4 signal and, and then uh, the, there's a receiving station. Anybody wants to try and see if they can receive it. You would need to have an, a good uh, two-way radio, full duplex uh, VHF, UHF radio that is SSB capable. And you would also need to have uh, one of those software tools to control the Doppler shift. But once you have that, uh, you can use your existing antennas to give it a try. And that would be fun to... Uh, explore and uh, could do a one-way uh, test first and eventually two-way. Uh, so, so I'd be more than happy to help uh, anybody who wants to try that. And then of course, have fun with exploring. It's uh, exciting to have those new, uh, new relatively new capabilities and, and see what uh, can be done with those and uh, work on your VOCC for satellite, for instance. 
Okay, that is pretty much it. There's a um, list of references here. I, I, I said uh, those those will be all, uh, of course, in the uh, in the uh, uh, PDF version that I upload eventually, and uh, you can click on those and uh, and uh, see what others have done. Okay, that's it. Well, great. Th thanks, man. For boy, that was a lot of great information. I'll kind of open it up. There were no questions that came in across uh, chat while you were presenting. Um, Anybody have any questions, any comments for Manfred? Uh, we'll kind of take a few of those before we pause uh, for the next part of the business meeting. Um, those egg beater I, uh, antennas, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They, they don't look like they would cost too much, yeah? Right. The most expensive part was probably uh, the BNC connector, actually. Right. Uh, yeah, it's like like those Fox antennas that we built. You know, the materials are probably $20, but it did take a while to... Uh, to tweak them to uh, to and, and put them together, it's not not a, a trivial thing to do, but but it's certainly inexpensive material-wise. Great presentation, Manfred. Thank you, Manfred. How much do you charge for uh, uh, those egg beater antennas? If I just uh, bought one from you, <laughs> <laughs> his side gig. <laughs> <laughs> Probably would be better to go to a company like M Squared. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Although that's, I mean, they, they have prices, you know, they're, they're not cheap if you buy a commercial product. I but know, that's what... I spend a lot of time with those tweaking and tuning. They have a perfect uh, performance, perfect impedance, uh, and uh, perfect uh, resonance frequencies and broadband and whatnot. And uh, so, so I'm happy, but it did, did uh, take uh, quite a bit of work to get there. Yeah, you and Jay could be our uh, manufacturers of antennas. Right. <laughs> Mandarin, uh -huh. could you uh, stop screen sharing, please? Oh, uh, yes, of course. I'm sorry. Let me see. Yes, we want to see each other. Oh, yeah. We want to oh, see right. your ugly mug. <laughs> All right. Thank you. I had a question, Manfred. I guess uh -huh. I put my video on. Um, is there an advantage to using two separate radios rather than try to pull this off all on a single radio? You know, uh, a UHF a radio and a VHF radio. Right. Mm, okay. Um, yeah, so that is how it was usually done in the, uh, shall we say, olden days. You know, mm -hmm. Michelle and others have, and, and probably Hal and others have experience with that. Uh, there were days when when, when you had an ICOM, uh, what, for two, 211 and a 411 or something like that. Um, you, you can certainly do that. Uh, but then, of course, you have to control both uh, radios individually and, uh, and still do the Doppler corrections. But, but yeah, 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 that certainly should work just fine. Okay, thank you. Hey, hey, Manfred, a question that had come up in the in the channel was a bill of materials uh, for the build. Was that in part of your reference uh, documentation? The uh, for the egg beaters, you mean? Yeah, I think so. Yes, the uh, yeah. If you go to the uh, to the ON Six Whiskey Golf website, uh, it has some drawings uh, that that show exactly how long the cables should be and. Uh, yeah, you just go to your hardware store and, and essentially find. I didn't exactly follow the uh, European uh, materials list, but uh, yeah. close to what we have here, you know, that's uh, no no problem. Yeah, uh, James, was that uh, was that your bill of materials question, or was it something different? WQ seventy. Uh, so when he got into uh, Manfred, when you got into this, uh -huh. did you have the ninety seven hundred already, or you know, did you start from ground zero? I started from ground zero. I only bought the ICOM 9700, 9700 this this summer, uh, but but I, I've done uh, satellite communications uh, for quite a while, uh, and, but mostly FM uh, using a mirror with a five eighth antenna on the car roof a long time ago in the early nineties, and then different charter emissions and things like that, uh, and but and I always used uh, either uh, one uh, one band radios like an ICOM. Uh, uh, what is it? The two two o two? No, not two o two. The the icon two c o two a t that one, and then and then I have a mobile radio Yezu uh, FT ninety seven seventy nine hundred R um, that works fine for FM um, for talking to the space station either voice FM or, or packet or SSTV TV reception. Uh, right, so I did that first, and I built those egg beaters for those experiments, and then uh, eventually. Uh, 
I thought, okay, what, what uh, if I want to do something more advanced, advanced here and try CW and SSB? And then I came across uh, the um, the uh, uh, FT4 article uh, in information on the bulletin board system, and, and then uh, I bought that radio this summer only. So it's it's all pretty new. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions for Manfred? All right, Manfred, wonderful presentation. If you'd uh, email me the deck, I'll get it posted mm -hmm. for, for everyone. And we'll certainly post this video up on the uh, club YouTube channel uh, this weekend. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, why, don't we take, uh, why don't we take, uh, Jim, what do you think? Five, uh, Jim and Phil, five minute break and we'll come back at uh, 11.05. Sounds good. I'm gonna <laughs> Sounds stop good this to recording. Me.